<laughs> okay, open in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. So, Matthew chapter 5. How long is a life sentence? You know how long a life sentence can be? 15 years to life. It can be up to life, but it can be 15 years. It can actually be longer than that. There's a guy named Charles Ridley. In 1994, he was sentenced to six life sentences, 5,000 years each. The longest sentence in U.S. history, 1994, Oklahoma, 30,000 years. This guy was sentenced to prison for 30,000 years. You know what some people say the longest sentence possible is? I do. <laughs> terrible joke, terrible joke. I didn't say who says that's the longest sentence possible. I'm just saying some people say it. So I've been married for almost 26 years. It'll be, when Pastor Julia's not in the, in the service today, and I, I told her, I said, you're missing out, babe. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep me in the line. I've been married almost 26 years. It'll be 26 years in February. And uh, it's been like the best five years of our life in there <laughs> at times. Because there's tri trials, there's challenges. You know, honestly, it's been really good. But there's, there's uh, not a marriage without difficulty. And there's not a relationship without difficulties. And that's how it's been from the very beginning of time. That's how it is through every family relationship in the scripture. There's not a perfect family in the scripture. You see some of the people who God honors and he, he speaks so well of. And then you can look at parts of their life and oftentimes their family life and you're like, that's a mess. David, you're a terrible father. <laughs> like, King David, like, he was not a great dad in so many ways. Like, not your example. Not your example. In other ways, great example. You look at, you know, Abraham, Sarah, how things went. I mean, the guy takes his kid up to sacrifice him before the Lord. And uh, he doesn't tell his kid that the Lord said to do this. His kid just carries the sticks and finds out when he's about to lay it down. Like, hey, like Abraham, you're going to walk them through this process a little bit better. Right? There's, there's just families that are messed up. Adam and Eve have Abel and Cain, and, and Cain slays Abel because he's upset because God favored Abel's worship offering, and he didn't favor Cain's, and Cain kills his brother. Families can get really complicated quick. And, and the same is true in our lives. Um, things can get really complicated. Things can be difficult, can't they? Relationships. And things can be extremely good as well. And I think that nothing is more satisfying and fulfilling than when relationships are good and life-giving. Right? Like, you think about this. There are people who live in places like Bakersfield in Oklahoma. And why do they live there? You ask. Because they have family and friends there. And so sure they can live in beautiful Northern California where life is good and sunny and, and, and it's just amazing. But yet they stay in these places because of relationships. Some of them other reasons as well, like, like Charles Ridley, he's going to be in Oklahoma for the next... 30,000 years because he was sentenced to that. But you think about this. There, there seems like there's nothing more important or valuable in life than great, healthy relationships. And there is a relationship that uh, the scripture speaks of and that we all are familiar with that is the most important human relationship, most valuable, most impactful, and that's marriage. And so we're walking through this Sermon on the Mount. And we're talking about how Jesus just gives some real practical application to his followers on how to live different. And as we're going through there, we see all kinds of things. He talks about the heart a lot. He talks about murder and, and how even anger in the heart, that's where it all starts. He talks about adultery, but it, it starts in the heart. He talks about 
going back to God's word and making sure that, that you don't skip it or, or overlook it. He talks about so many important things just in the first couple of verses of this passage. He's up there, he's preaching to his, his disciples, and then he gets to this section in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. And he says this. In fact, let's read it from the screen. Out loud and loudly together. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let me just tell you something. As I'm walking through this, I'm thinking, okay, we are walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't really want to preach this message at any given point on any given Sunday. Because I just don't know when is a good time to actually walk through this. Because I know that there's probably very, there are very few situations, topics that could be more sensitive to people. Because of the experience maybe with their own marriage or what they have experienced with divorce. I also know that there's some people who are not married, don't want to be married, or, you know, they want to be not, uh, not married. You know, whatever it is, there's, it's a sensitive topic. And as we look at this, we know that some people, they carry a lot of shame associated with divorce. We know that there's been a lot of mixed messaging and, and uh, uh, oppression, you know, placed on people over the topic of divorce. And people have been rejected. People have been... Um, really confused and, and angry over the whole situation. And so it's just a sensitive topic. And then I know like there's new people who come to church and you're, I'm thinking, gosh, is that what I want them to hear us talking about the first Sunday that they come? Is that we're talking about divorce? But yet here's the reality. We look around us and we realize marriage, that's happening. And divorce is also happening. And Jesus cares about both. And he cares about the people involved in both. And he cares enough to speak about it. And I think that today, while I'm not going to be able to get into all the, the reasons for divorce and, and, and the, the things that God has to say about res restoration and the wives and the can and all this, I just want to start to open this up from what I see in the scripture. Can we do that? Because I think God has something he wants to say to us. And so it starts off right here in Matthew chapter 5, and he's just preaching it. And he says, it was also said. Jesus says that because he was just teaching, and he said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So he gets to this topic, and he says, it was also said. Now, let's pause for a second, because when we read the scripture, this is what I want us to do. I want us to be able to open up the scripture, read through it, and say, what is he saying? And sometimes some things will speak to you more than others. But here, if you just pause, he, thought, he, he kicks it off and he says, it was said. Now, in Jesus' time, there was a controversy between two prominent rabbis. There is Hillel and there is Shammai, but I call him Shamu, because I don't know if he really pronounced his name Shammai. So Shamu and Hillel, strict versus lenient. Shamu was super strict on the topic of divorce. The only reason that you could have a divorce, that you could, you, you know, divorce your spouse is because of adultery. And it was the man who divorces his wife because she committed adultery. So it's very strict, this very narrow guideline. Now, Hillel, he took the other approach. He's like very lenient when it comes to it. So this is, this is his approach that you can divorce your wife for anything. She looks at you funny. Boom, she's out of there. She cooks your meal wrong. Boom, she's done. You want to trade her in for a new one? Boom, get another wife. Whatever reason you wanted, you could, under the law, write her a certificate of divorce, and she is done with. Now, understand this. In the culture of the time, this right here, uh, divorce was prominent back then. So don't, sometimes we think divorce is running rampant today. Divorce has always been running rampant as long as there's been marriage. Did you know that? It's always been the case. We talk about crime. Crime's terrible today. Crime's always been bad. Crime has always been No, there's ebbs and flows. There's ups and downs of different crimes. Same thing with divorces. Maybe more or less there's seasons. But it was running rampant then too. Among God's people. 
And there were some of the rabbis, the teachers or, or the, the pastors of the day who were teaching, you can get divorced for any reason that you want. So this is the context that Jesus dives into right here. And he says, you have heard it said. So you've heard it said by these people who are talking about this. It's current pop culture. This is a hot topic. People are talking about it. People are acting on it. The, the church, the God's people are acting on this. And so he, he kicks off his message about divorce that way. And he says, it was said. Now it's important to ask the question, where was it said? Where was it said that if you divorce your wife, give her a certificate of, of divorce? Where was it said? Because the other things that Jesus approached, like you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery or you shall not murder. Both of those things are said in scripture. But then he says, it was also said, but there's no scripture for it. So he brings something out from the current conversation. He said, you're listening to what other people are saying and you're acting on that. So he, if you look at something that is close to it, what Hillel and Shamu were basing their interpretation on, it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Now this is important because how many of you have heard that the only legitimate biblical reason for divorce is adultery? Have you ever heard that before? Okay, I'm not saying that that is the only, I'm just saying you've heard it, right? And then there are, there are uh, I, I, again, there's a lot of scripture that talks about divorce and reasons for divorce. But we're pretty familiar that this is, you know, this has been said. But Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. And it goes on to say that if she remarries again and that guy does the same thing to her, that the first husband can't take her back. Did this right here say whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce? Did, he, did it say that? It doesn't say that. It says when a man takes a wife and marries her, if she then finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of the Lord. He basically sends her out. So, so that passage is vague. And that's why there is this, these two extreme interpretations of it. Whereas on one side, someone said, yeah, something that she doesn't find favor in your eyes. Well, her, your coffee was burnt. Your toast didn't have enough butter on it. What, I mean, these were like conversation pieces. I'm not making this stuff up. Like, this is the kind of stuff that uh, they, were, they were divorcing over. I, you have offended me. You've angered me. You have not served me right. Served me well. Uh, you talked back to me. You didn't, you know, clean the house well. I'm done with you. And so you found, you've been displeasing in my eyes. There, is a, there was a stretch way over here on the understanding of the scripture men. And the scripture's not super clear, but it talks about this indecency that's found in her. Now, others would say, well, that's likely because there is adultery that took place. And there is the, uh, the act where he may issue a certificate of divorce. So we're just tracking with what the scripture is saying. And I think the best way to understand what is the heart of God on something is just to read what he said about it. And then to get an understanding. And then when you don't understand it, you have to ask some questions. And you have to look at, well, what does the rest of the scripture say? So here's the point, though. Jesus said, you've heard it said, but that wasn't said in scripture. That was based on some things in scripture, but it was not scriptural. What you have heard said. And so there's another place that Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 19. And starting in verse 1, or verse 3, it says, The Pharisees came up to him, and they tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, by the way, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. They were the strictest, you know, uh, followers of, of the law, and they, they tried to follow it to a T. But when it came to this issue of divorce, they loved Hillel more than Shabbat. They liked the idea that we can just get a new wife if we want to. 
So they come to Jesus and the, the Bible says they were testing him, right? Okay, so I'm going to read it and then we'll, we'll back up a little bit. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And I love this last verse. Then the disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man and woman, it's better not to marry. Like they, they heard all this and they're like, oh man, I think maybe it's just better off if you don't get married. Save yourself all kinds of pain. But, but here's the deal. Think about the context of the scripture you're reading and catch certain words. The first thing it says is that the Pharisees came to him and they were testing him. So they weren't coming with a question of, hey, what do you, what do you really say about this, Jesus? I want to know. But they were testing him. They, they were trying to find a reason to say, gotcha. Because they knew public opinion was in their favor that you could just have, you know, no commitment and, and you could divorce for any single reason. And they were trying to make him look out of step with the current popular opinion. This is like when you have an interview on the news and you have this pastor whose family or whose church, they just, they fed the homeless and they, they rescued fire victims and they, they gave to the orphans and did all these great things. And then, and then the interviewer says, and what do you think about homosexuality? Or, and what do you think about the president? Or what do you think about this, you know, the way the police did this over here? They try to throw in these gotcha moments to catch them off guard, even though there's all these other things that are uh, that are important to talk about, but they're really trying to say this preacher is out of step. And ultimately, we want to, you know, rile up the council, council culture and turn them against this preacher and see how religion and Christianity is really irrelevant and it's out of date and it, it shouldn't be something that we follow. That's kind of like what's happening right here. The Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to be caught up in the hot topic of the day so that they can turn people against him. The Pharisees, in their approach to this whole situation, here's another thing to catch. They were focused on divorce, the grounds for divorce. When it came to the marriage covenant, that was the big deal to them. But Jesus, if you look at his focus, he's not focused on divorce. He's focused on marriage. And his response was not about divorce first. His response was about marriage. And so when you look at the way that Jesus responded to them, he said, first of all, have you not read? So they're coming with their opinions and Jesus goes back to scripture. This is important for us because when we're trying to figure out where the, where, how do we approach or, or view a hot topic? Where do we start? We start with the scripture. We go back. So Jesus is, is not just jumping into the conversation with his own ideas or opinion. He's saying, have you not read? You are so focused on your own ideas to justify what your flesh wants that you might as well be saying, I have no idea what God says about this, but this is what I think he should say. <laughs> You might as well say, I don't really know what God says, and I'm not going to take the time to open up the book to find out, but this is my opinion. Have you ever had a conversation like that? Where somebody, it's just clear that, that even, I'm, and I'm talking about maybe those who would say they're, they're, they're following after God, they're pursuing the Lord, but then they would say uh, something along the lines of this to where they have no idea or understanding what the scripture says. And so God is trying to say to us, hey, these things are important. But go back to what I said, because I have something to say about this. And so he directs them back to Scripture. He always points back to Scripture. And in this case, he points back to Genesis 1 and 2. He points back to creation, and he points back to the institution of marriage. And he says, in the very beginning, God created them male and female. 
And so here is creation, and this is where it all started. And then he goes on to talk about how when the man leaves his family, joins to his wife, the two become one flesh. And what he's saying is this, marriage is a sacred work between God, between the man and the woman. But even more than that, here's something we need to know about why marriage is so important. Because we are image bearers. We are image bearers. So he points back to the garden about creation. And when you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you find that God said, let us make man, mankind, in our image and according to our likeness. And then so he makes them male and female in his image. And then he commands them to be his representative on earth. And he says, you be fruitful, you multiply, you fill the earth, you, you, you subdue it, you take the name. You have been given this earth to represent me. Now, when it, the first thing he does with them, though, is that he institutes this act of marriage. He said, this is how you will represent me on earth. This marriage is an institution that really is less about you guys, and it's more about me and you. What do I mean by that? Ephesians chapter 5. Is it okay if we just talk through this a little? Teach it? Okay, I'm glad you're, you're okay with that. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This is a, a, a passage that's often talked about in marriage conferences or, or in weddings, but it says this in, in Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the, Let me pause there. I know that even reading some of these verses, that people have been abused by them so much that even using that word submit can cause all kinds of other triggers. And can, can I just say this? Um, can, we, can we not focus on that right now? Because this is a word in the Bible and there's a way to do it and there's a way not to. And it, submission is always the heart of the one submitting, and it's never the one demanding submission. Let's put it that way. So if a husband ever says, you're to submit to me, he's already off track, and we can't even get there. Okay? That, you can't do it that way. So the submission has to come from the heart. So, but that's another topic. So stop asking about it. Okay. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. These are things that, by the way, the church doesn't always do a good job explaining it. Sometimes we don't have enough time. Sometimes we're just jerks. Sometimes, you know, we just, we don't hear it right, whatever it is. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Christ is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for her. So in the same way that Jesus loves the church and gave himself for her, how did he do that? Sacrificially, right? Laid his life down, denied himself. That's how husbands are to lay, love their wives. Verse 26, that he might sanctify or set her apart and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, and just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and his bones. Verse 31 goes back to Genesis. Look at this. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now here's the point, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul has taken this time to explain marriage. But he says this about marriage. Marriage on earth is a representation of the, of the relationship between God and his people. And so when God wants to explain what his relationship and his commitment to his people is like, he, he doesn't say, my relationship with you is sort of like your marriage one to another. No, he actually says, no, I, I am committed to you like this, so therefore I want you to have this to reflect that on earth. So marriage is actually a representation on earth 
of the relationship between God and his people. So there's a divine order to it, and that's what the scripture is saying, that Christ is the, is the, the groom, the church is the bride. And you see this throughout the scripture that God has always uh, acted, and he's always spoken of himself like this, uh, a husband to Israel, for example, in the Old Testament. And they were oftentimes the unfaithful wife who went after other lovers, the other gods. And yet, though they were unfaithful to him, God still would take them back. He's saying, I am committed to you in the best way that I can uh, communicate to you my covenant and commitment to you th so that you would understand it is that we establish marriage on earth. Now, when that marriage breaks down on earth, there's a breakdown of the representation of the relationship between God and man. And so this is where we go back to God is so for marriage and he so doesn't want divorce because of the impact in your own life, the impact on your family, the impact on society, but also the representation of the relationship with God. When we take the marriage relationship lightly, we take the relationship with God lightly. When we see the, the divorce and the destruction that happens through that, we understand the heart of God that also grieves over the loss of relationship with his people. And so it's really less about the marriage between, you know, husband and wife here, and it's more about the relationship between God and his people. And so this is where marriage often comes under attack. And, and for example, there's been a lot of discussion about what is marriage and, and uh, it, you know, it, is it only between man and woman or, or do you even have to be married and all these other things. And those are side conversations because the real issue is not about what it looks like on earth, though it is important. The real issue is that it is misrepresenting the intention in the heart of God. And so... Everything that twists the relationship between God and his people, God is saying, oh, you're, you're twisting, you're, you're twisting that among yourselves, and it really causes you to misunderstand your relationship with me. So we are image bearers from the very beginning. We bear his image, and in the relationship with God, we bear that in our relationship with one another. And so Jesus is pointing back to creation, he's pointing back to scripture, when they're saying, hey, can we just go and get divorced for any reason at all? And then he says, because God has done this, he's, he says, don't let any man separate that. Don't let any man come in and just tell you that, that you can throw it all away. This is something that is sacred and valuable. Now I say this, and Jesus said it as well to a crowd of people, many of whom had experienced divorce. Many of whom who had been probably pushed out to the side. Many who have pushed someone out to the side, or whether it was mutual or whatever reason, this is not uncommon in his day. And he's coming and he's talking to them, not so much about divorce, but about marriage. And I think that it would do us well to spend time focusing more on the value and the power and the importance of what it takes to have a healthy marriage in life. And this starts from a young age. And this is for those of us who have been married. And all of us, whether we're married or not, or even intend to be or not, it helps us to understand, oh, what, what do I need to be to be in a healthy relationship, a relationship that lasts, a marriage that lasts. But ultimately, how does this reflect my relationship with God? Because I want that relationship to be healthy, flourishing, and to last. Amen. And that's the heart of God. Now, going back to this passage in Matthew 19. So Jesus says to him this, when God has joined together, that no man separate. Then they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Now, let me ask you this. Did Moses command it? He did not. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, says, when a man takes a wife, if she finds no favor and has found some indecency, and he writes. So he's saying, if, she, if, if there is some reason that he divorces her, 
And if he writes her a certificate of divorce, he did not command that he divorce. So these little words matter because in the way they're thinking, they're hinging their decisions upon it. And they're saying, no, Moses commanded us to divorce. Look at that. I'm just following the law, follow the word, right? I'm good. And so Jesus responds to him though. And uh, he said, he says, don't blame Moses. He said, Moses allowed it. See Jesus's response? Moses, why did Moses command it? Jesus says, oh, actually Jesus, uh, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your heart. So what, why does he do that? You see, God's desire was never for, for the divorce, but why does he do it? Jesus is pointing out the motivation of the heart for people to want to divorce in the situation that he's referring to. He's saying the hearts were hard and, and Moses is saying he's allowing this to happen, but he puts them in the situation and says, if you do this, if there's something that is so defiling in that person that you're putting them out and they go somewhere else and then that person puts them out as well, divorces them, you can't take them back. If it was so bad to kick them out, you can't take them back because this was happening. And also knowing that when you do this, it's going to be a final act in that relationship. And he's not saying it's the law that it's got to be a final act. He's saying this is it. You're cutting it. You're cutting them off. In fact, Jesus at a different time, he says, Who, whoever, um, well, actually, I, I think it's at this time. He says, whoever divorces his, whoever divorces his wife accepts sexual morality, marries another, commits adultery. Another, ver another place, he says, and he caused, if she remarries, he causes her to commit adultery. Here's what he's saying. In the situation, the culture, the woman doesn't have the ability just to go and take care of herself and move on like, like so often we do. And so you don't have this culture where being a woman that is divorced is, is an okay thing in their situation. It's okay for the man, but not the woman. It says that you're putting her in a vulnerable position. And, and you are causing her to be out there and at a vulnerable place where she can be taken advantage of. And not only that, but you're putting her in a position to where she's engaging into another relationship. And you're saying, and again, the representation of marriage, when you go from one spouse to another, he's saying that reflects the relationship of God with his people of leaving your husband, your maker, and going after other gods. Now I want to get to that because Jesus is sitting here and he's saying, when you remarry, there's this adultery that takes place. Now all of this can sit here and you're probably thinking, where, where, where are we going with this, Daniel? Where are we going with this? Are you saying that everyone who divorces is, and remarries is in adultery? And are you saying I'm an adulterer? And, and this is not a fun Thanksgiving message. And I don't know if I'm, I'm glad that I brought my friend on this day. And all that other stuff. And maybe I feel worse than when I came in. I, I don't think we're going to end there. <laughs> Here's what Jesus says. What he, what, well, actually, let's go with what he's not saying. What he's not saying is this. He's not saying adultery is grounds for divorce. You might say, wait a minute. I think it's, it is. I'm not saying it's not either. I'm not saying he, that he's saying it is. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about reasons to get divorced. He's talking about the impact of divorce. And he's saying that, that when you get divorced because God has intended the two to become one flesh, in God's eyes, you will always be one flesh. Whether it's a dumb marriage in your eyes or a terrible marriage or whatever, there's something spiritual that happens in marriage. This is sacred. And we can devalue it or we can, and we can look at it and say, oh, you know, it's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. But in God's eyes, it really is two becoming one. And regardless of whether we were Christians or not at the time, or when, when the divorce takes place and then you remarry, he's saying this. He's saying there is an adultery. It's, an, it's adultery. Now pause for a second. Because the only time he says it's not adultery is in the case of sexual immorality as the reason for the divorce. Now we're just reading what the scripture says. It's not what we've heard it said. It's just what it says. 
But what he's not saying is sexual immorality is the reason for divorce or a justifiable reason. And he's also saying it's not justifiable or that there aren't other reasons. Can I tell you this? I think there's a lot of reasons, several reasons in the scripture that it gives to justify divorce. But he's not talking about all those right now. He's talking about the sanctity of marriage. And, and so he says, in that case, when you remarry, it's not adultery. Now, Jesus is always pro-marriage. He's, he's, his will is this, that, that a man and a woman be in a healthy, fulfilling, fruitful, life-giving marriage. This is, this is his desire for marriage. And this happens when there's humility, when there is a surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus personally in your own life, and when you lay down your life for your spouse. Amen? Amen. This, is, this is the reality. If you want a happy, healthy, fruitful marriage, you're going to have to walk in humility, surrender your life to Jesus, and lay your life down for your spouse. There are people who, who stay married their whole life, and they have terrible marriages. That's not God's best. There are people who, who are in committed relationships their whole life, but they never get married. I think you're, you're also missing out on that as well. But here's the deal. Jesus, he's not sitting here and he's not uh, trying to give reasons for divorce. He's trying to get people to focus on, on the power of marriage and the life giving marriage. He's pro-marriage. This is the, the um, going back to Matthew chapter 5. He said, actually, let's not go back there again. Um, let's just go back to this here. So Jesus is talking, he's pro-marriage, but then there's so many different reasons that people get divorced, right? Sometimes, uh, and probably in every case, it's traumatic, it's painful, even if the people are glad they did it after. Because there are sometimes people are like, I'm glad we got divorced because that person was, was abusive, they were hurtful, they were bitter, it was terrible, it was the worst season of my life, it was everything that marriage is not supposed to be. There are others who it's mutual, and then there's times when it's just one who wants it and the other doesn't. Either way, no matter what situation, it's always hard and difficult. And sometimes, as Christians, we get mixed messages about how to relate or what God says about it. We get confused by it. Again, it just heaps rejection on us, doubt and unbelief. Here's, here's uh, what Malachi says. 2.16. For the Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce because it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Why is God saying that? He's not saying, some people hear that and they think, does God hate the divorced person? It's not saying that. He's not saying that he hates you or the one who, who is divorcing someone else. He's not saying that. He's saying he hates divorce because it's covers the, the garment with violence because it tears something apart in the heart and the soul of the people. And so when God looks at his people going through these things, it breaks his heart and he hates it. But he doesn't put shame and condemnation on the people. He says, I want to save you from this. So we have to go back and 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 look at what the scripture says because he doesn't say he hates divorced people and it also doesn't say that this is the unforgivable sin. Let me say that again. Divorce is not an unforgivable sin. And there are some people I know even talking about this and talking about like the, these guidelines that in this narrow understanding that could feel like worse about their past and their experience. And, and actually, Jesus wants to lift that burden off your shoulders. Because here's the deal about the law that would even say that um, you shall not commit adultery and that marriage is for, between two for life. And when you tear that apart, there's this violation of covenant. If you remarry, that's adultery. That's what the law would say. But you need to understand something about the law of God. And this is so important is that the law can never save you. The law of God is never meant to point out to you uh, how to be saved. It's never to lift burdens off your back or to tell you you're a good person. 
The law of God always reveals the righteousness of God, the perfect and the ideal. And then when we look at it like in a mirror, we realize we don't quite uh, match that. And it's never meant to condemn you. It's always meant to, to uh, be this plumb line so that you re recognize your need for grace. So there are people in the audience that Jesus is preaching to that have experienced this right here. And he says, this is what the, the heart of God is. It's for your marriage. This is the reality. But this is why I've come. Because the world doesn't always work out according to God's law and his perfect plan. And so here we have it to where uh, Jesus is, is preaching and he's ministering this to people. And he's wanting to remind them about God who's the faithful husband to his people. That although they go after their, their other gods and they're unfaithful, he's still willing to restore and take them back. And he sees on earth in these relationships when there's brokenness there that is not God's best plan. Still in the midst of that, what the enemy means for evil God will turn that around for good. And there is the ability for God to restore. There is the ability for, of God to renew. There is the ability of God to strengthen. And some of you have been in relationships that many have probably thought, you have justifiable cause to kick that buddy to the curb, right? And move on with your life. And you have held on to God because you're believing for restoration. And you've seen God at work. Others might still be believing God for things that you have yet to see. And others, you're in a situation where that ship sailed long ago. And yet, even in the midst of that, God can take what the enemy means for evil. And he turns it for good. And he can minister to your heart right where you're at and re bring hope, renewal, strength. I don't think that anybody ever jumps into marriage thinking, I can't wait to get divorced. <laughs> I mean, maybe, uh, like, you know, sugar daddy, this guy's a multi-billionaire, and someone's saying, I'm going to marry him, he's got like three years left. Like, I don't know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I shouldn't say that. This is being recorded. <laughs> but here's the deal. God is willing and able to take these people back. This is what we need to know. I don't, I don't know how I'm doing here. My message. Oh, I'm, I'm over time. Um, I really, I, I really am concerned about talking about this because I feel like I am opening up a can that I can't close in one message. And so it's something we have to have conversation about, real honest conversation. And we can't just go with what the world says. We, we have to go back to what, what it's written. Here's, here's, here's how I want to wrap up. First thing is, understand this. Marriage on earth is a representation of the relationship between God and man. If you want to read an excellent book, it's called The Divine Romance. And it's by a guy whose name I don't remember. <laughs> but you'll probably find it. I think it's like Eugene Edwards or something. Excellent book. And if you can listen to it on audio, and you get, I think Eugene reading it, he has a grandpa's voice, and you listen to it, and you're like, this is good. This is so good. I've never seen that before in scripture. And he ties the entire scripture from beginning to end together, and shows you that this book is not a book of laws and rules. It is a divine romance between a God who is pursuing his bride. Amen. And at the cross, he makes it all possible. And at the very end, you see the wedding that takes place, and it's beautiful. And so everything on earth is meant to reflect that. Second thing is, we should focus more on healthy marriages and not get caught up focusing on reasons for divorce. I want to pause and say this. If you are in a situation where, like, or you know someone that's in an abusive situation, sometimes people say, well, you know, you just have to forgive them and you have to just believe, you know, that God can turn that around because adultery is the only reason for divorce and I'd say that is terrible counsel you you get separate from that situation as fast as you can and you you find a, a group of people that will help keep you safe and you call the police and you do whatever it takes and and you try not to get 
men that think mean thoughts about being vigilantes to deal with that, but you kind of want to. But, <laughs> but I'm just telling you, it's never okay. And you never are, are stuck in a relationship like that before God. He's never, he's never telling you you're stuck in that situation. There's other reasons as well that uh, you probably got to move on, but focus on healthy marriages. Last thing is, again, the law of God will never save us. The law of God will never save you. It reveals your sin and it points to your need for the Savior. That's why Jesus went to the cross. So my parents, they divorced when I, after 19 years of marriage. When I got to about the 18 year mark, there was this little concern on the inside. Are we going to make it? Not the, we weren't even in a place that we might not make it. But you know the patterns. Can we, can we go longer than my parents? Here's the deal. Jesus breaks patterns. Yes. He breaks generational patterns. Yes. And so by the grace of God, we made it. Yes. And we're still making it. And we're planning on making it all the way for this life sentence. So death to do us part, right? Here's the deal. Um, invite the grace of God into your situation Regardless, you're married, not married. Marriage is, is great. Marriage is not so great. You want to be married. You have regret and shame from the past. Uh, whatever it is, here's the deal. God is for you. And he wants to he, he, he bear your burdens, lighten your load, forgive, cleanse, set free, make new, turn things around, walk with you through whatever situation in life you're in. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Can you bow your heads for just a second and just, can you respond to the Lord? And, and God, I'm really hoping that you said some things that were more important than what I said, that people caught what you're saying. And, and Lord, I, I, there's so much that I know you want to communicate. You want to communicate your love. You want to communicate how important uh, we are to you and how you won't leave us or forsake us that you'll never kick us out or just be so displeased with us that you move on Lord because you're always pursuing you're always going after us but Lord we thank you for that thank you Lord Jesus that not only do you apply grace for anyone who's been under condemnation we lift that off anyone who's been under guilt we lift that off anybody who, who has just felt this this heaviness or regret, Lord God, come alongside and minister to him by your spirit. We thank you for that. We bless you. We thank you, Lord, that we would uh, develop strong and healthy marriages that reflect our relationship with you. And more than anything, we pray that we would have a strong, healthy relationship with you. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet.